look at uh, faith and tyranny. Mm. And uh, I don't see the card here anymore talking about the... Uh, it is here. Okay. I'll... Good morning. I'm Pastor Fred Dig. I'm at the Doors of the Word Baptist Church in Newberry, Ohio. And our address is 14781 Sperry Road. Newberry, Ohio, 44065. And uh, if you're hearing us on the radio, you're hearing us on Liberty Works Radio Network, 104.3 FM, the Eagle in Camp and Ocala. And uh, this is, program is replayed on Sunday at 2, 8 a.m. and 3 and 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And their website is Liberty Works radionetwork.com. And the title of the message today is Faith and Tyranny. And uh, we're going to see what, uh, first we're going to have a couple verses in, in Psalms. And in Psalms, uh, Psalm 9, verse 17 to 20. Okay, verse 17 says, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. And this is one of the things we have to remember, that uh, if a nation forgets God, they're in big trouble. Amen. They do not uh, have a leg to stand on, so to speak. That's one of evolutionary jokes about evolution not having a leg to stand on. But either do nations that, that uh, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Forget God. Uh, for the needy shall not always be for, forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord, let no man prevail. Let the heathen be judged in thy sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves, but that men, that they are but men. So the uh, nations have to know that, uh, and their leaders know that they're just men. And that's one of the problems with leaders today. They think they're, well, in the, in the case of our country, they think they're gods. That's right. Mm -hmm. Especially the Supreme Court. They're saying, mm -hmm. oh, Murr is one, all right, if we say it's all right, then, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we can destroy the moral fabric of America, and we can kick out God, and then we can do anything we want to do, because the, the Constitution, what we say it means, it, it doesn't mean what it says. Mm -hmm. It's what we say it means. And that's not uh, what the, really the Constitution is. Amen. Uh, the original intent is something the, boy, the founding fathers kept warning about. They says you have to look at the Federalist Papers and the, the uh, notes they took at the uh, Constitu uh, the convention and things like that to find out what the Constitution is talking about. Mm -hmm. It's not something you can just say, well, you know, well, we think uh, sodomy is all right now. Uh, you should be allowed to do that because... Uh, we want to change the morals of the country. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And if you want to uh, use this so-called right now to destroy uh, American businesses run by Christians, well, that's perfectly all right, too. The courts will go right along with this, which they have done. Mm -hmm. Our country's in big trouble. Amen. Well, I'm going to go back right now and look at what uh, God told Israel about the way they should be acting and what they should be doing. And we're going to go back to uh, Deuteronomy 28. And there's a promise of blessings for obedience. And I'm going to start in verse 1. And it shall come to pass that thou will hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and do all that his commandments which I command thee this day that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. So here he's saying if you do these things, you'll be above all nations. You'll be on a plane above them. You will not be down in the dirt, so to speak. And that's what happens when you uh, disregard God. You go in a much lower elevation. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. 
if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shall the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of the ground, and the fruit of the cattle, and the increase of thine kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. So here everything is going to be blessed by the Lord if you follow what he tells you to do. Amen. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies to rise up against thee, to, the, to be smitten and before thy face. So if enemies come up against you, you'll be a strong and powerful country. And America used to be that way. Yeah. We've thrown that away. Yeah. In fact, Mr. Obama, when we were in Iraq, he says, oh, we got to cut and run. We don't want to win this war. Why would we want to win it? After all, those are Muslims there. They're my friends. And my, they're blessed people of the world, as far as Mr. Obama's concerned, because they're so peaceful and loving. And we see how that is all the time in this country. When they kill people, it's, it's not terrorism. It's only if some guy who's got mental illness goes and kills somebody. That is terrorism. But if Muslims do it, then it's perfectly all right. Let's see where we are here. All right, guys, in verse 7. The Lord shall cause thy enemies to rise up against thee, smitten before thy face. They shall come against thee one way, and flee before thee seven ways. So here God says that, you know, if they come against you, I'm going to disperse them and defeat them. The Lord shall command the blessings upon thy storehouses in all that thou settest thine hand unto, and he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The Lord shall establish thee in the holy people unto himself, as he has sworn unto thee. If thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God, and walk in his ways, and all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. Now, people in America today, uh, you mention God, and they want to get rid of you, kick you out. Uh, in fact, you aren't allowed to mention God in many places. Uh, and today in town halls and, and places like that, and God's name isn't even allowed to be mentioned. Not allowed to be mentioned in schools anymore. Uh, prayers aren't allowed in school unless you do it undercover. It's uh, amazing the way our country has become from what it was at one time. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the fruit of the ground, which the land, Lord thy God, Swear unto thy fathers to give thee, and the Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto the land in his season, to bless all the works of thy hand, and thou shalt lend unto other nations, and thou shalt not borrow. Well, today we're a bigger borrowing nation in the world. Yeah. We owe money to China, we owe money to everybody, it seems like Japan. It seems like, uh, all, other than some third world countries, we owe money to everybody. And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail, and thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. If thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day, and observe and do all of them. So here's what God promised them, that he's going to be, make them uh, so much better than, than the rest of the peoples. And early in our country, we had uh, kind of the same thing happening. Uh, if you look through the, the awakenings of the uh, pre-revolution, pre uh, you have all these uh, people who many of us have heard of, uh, Jonathan Edwards. Most people have heard of him. He was a great preacher of pre-revolution. Uh, how about George Whitfield? Another one. You know, so there's, there was a lot of uh, people who were who were involved in uh, getting our country uh, under God. They had all these revivals. They had uh, uh, Stoddard's Harvest in Northampton, Massachusetts, and Theodore Freeling's, yeah, Freeling's in, <laughs> in New Jersey. 
Conrad, uh, Jonathan Conrad Brazel in, uh, had a German awakening in Ephrata, Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, there was all these different awakenings. There's an awakening under David Brainerd. All these were before the revolution, and it made our people strong. And therefore, we were able to stand up against the tyranny that was being brought down upon us. Uh, it seemed like uh, that we were just everywhere. Uh, Christianity seemed to be everywhere before the, the, uh, the revolution. Uh, there was Methodist and Baptist awakenings in Virginia. So you can see that, that there was uh, also George Whitfield went to Britain and tried to waken them up, and uh, the people wakened up, but the government didn't, unfortunately. So we ended up being in a, a great war against the uh, Britain at that time. But let's look what happens if you disobey God. And we're going to go in the same chapter, and I'm going to read verse 14 first. And thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day, to the right or to the left, Go after other gods and serve them. And then we're going to jump to uh, just 37. And thou shalt become an astonishment and a proverb and a byword amongst all the nations whither the Lord shall lead thee. So here's what God says if you re uh, reject him, you know, you're going to be rejected by the countries. And our country's that same way today. So our, our friends don't trust us, our enemies laugh at us. I mean, you don't see ISIS being real scared of two or three bombings a day of, of non-essential facilities, do you? They don't seem to be afraid of us at all. Nope. Now I'm going to jump to verse 47. Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart and with abundance of all things. So here you can see that what we've done. We've just kicked God out. It's something that's... Uh, just in, since basically 1960, God has been kicked out of every place in America where he was before. Wherefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee, in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness, and in want of things, and he shall put the yoke of iron upon thy neck until he hath destroyed thee. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from afar, from the far ends of the earth, as swift as an eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. Well, today we have invasions from, from two different areas of the world. One is from our south. I don't understand Spanish. I don't know if many of you do or not. But, but there's a nation that's, uh, they aren't particularly trying to attack us, but they do want to take about a third of our nation and claim it for Mexico. And we have another nation who's being brought here in large numbers to speak Arabic and Farsi and languages like that who I don't understand. And they want to change everything here. Mm. They want to change our law form and kill everybody who's not a, a Muslim and, and things like that. I, to me, that is uh, totally against America, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And verse 50 says, A nation of fierce countenance which shall not regard the person of old or show favor to the young. Well, that, that kind of meets what we're seeing in our country now. Yeah. And he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle and the fruit of the land, and thou shalt be destroyed, which also shall not leave thee either corn, or oil, or wine, or increase of the kind, or flock, or sheep, until he hath destroyed thee. Well, this hasn't really happened now, but, but we have a, a war now of our own government upon the people. Uh, Mr. Obama said he wants to destroy the coal industry now. That's not what a president is supposed to be doing. Nope. And of course, after that, the price of electricity is going to naturally skyrocket. Yeah. He's supposed to be for the people, not against the people. Amen. I mean, how many times have you seen a president says, I hate the people and I want to raise their taxes and uh, make it so they can't afford their electricity or the, and if he had his way, he wouldn't be able to afford the gasoline to, in your car or the the heat of your home either, of course, with fracking and things like that, it's uh, made Saudi Arabia want to destroy it and pumping out uh, 
oil and things like that at a re really reduced rate. Exactly. But still the coal industry is just about gone. There are many mm -hmm. companies going bankrupt now and it's only because our president. That's right. And he says he's done this with the, the phone and the pen. Well, he called the EPA and says, I don't want pro coal to be burned in this country anymore. And make rules so they won't be allowed to. Mm -hmm. And they did. And that's the reason it's going the way it is. Mm -hmm. And now we have people complaining about Utilities wanting to raise rates. Well, they can blame it on Mr. Obama. That's he right. is the guilty yeah, party. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. I'm sure he wouldn't admit it, but uh, anybody who can think a little bit can see that that's where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. Okay, back to the enemy now in 52. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates until thy high and fenced walls come down wherein thou trustest throughout all thy land, and he shall besiege thee in thy gates throughout all thy land which the Lord thy God hath given thee. And thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body, and the fruit of thy sons and daughters which the Lord thy God hath given thee, in the siege and in the straightness wherein thine enemy shall distress thee. Well, these last couple things have not come to pass, but they could very easily. I was just reading a thing recently where they expect our country to be in a place where we'll have civil unrest almost continually because of the policies set in place unless things can be turned around. Uh, I, we see uh, these Black Lives Matter now. They can block any roadway they want to. Uh, Muslims in, in New York City and other cities, they just block the roads wherever they want to have a prayer meeting. And that's perfectly all right. They don't get arrested, tickets, nothing. It's, perfectly all right because they're the privileged class today yeah. and nobody knows why that is but but uh, that's the case now we're going to look at some of uh, Israel's failures and we're going to look in the book of Judges because that's where the major ones were and in the book of Judges the people were basically uh, disarmed even though there were some weapons around yet the people were basically disarmed. <coughs> I guess I don't have one there. Okay, the book of Judges. Probably have Judges Mark, but I guess I don't. It's not far back anyway, so. And basically what happened is because they rejected God. Yes, ended up in Joshua. <laughs> uh, we're going to start out in uh, Judges 3. And this is <coughs> one of uh, the failures. And uh, we're going to uh, start out in Verse 15, but when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer. Now, what did God just say back here in the beginning? You know, if you want to follow me and, and he cry, basically cry out to God for help, he says, he's helping. He's going to send them a deliverer. And we'll see this throughout the book of Judges. And uh, so here, verse 16 here, but Ahud made him a dagger which had two edges of a cubit length, and he did gird it under his raiment upon his right thigh. So here's this man, they're basically they're disarmed during this whole book of Judges, as we'll see. They had a few weapons, but they weren't have, didn't have many. And he brought a present to Eglon, king of Moab, and Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had made an end of offering the present, he sent away the people that bear the present. But he himself turned away from the quarries that were by Gilgal and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who said, Keep thy silence, and all that stood by him went out from him. So he said he had something for him. And he had came unto him, and he was sitting in a summer parlor, which he had for himself alone. And Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee. And he arose out of his seat. 
And he who had put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. So here's what you would say he was a, a murderer. But the people were oppressed because of this man. And that's what uh, seems sometimes people don't remember when you're reading about it. This was uh, trying to save his people from this evil king. And the haft also went in after the blade. The haft closed upon the blade so that he could not draw out the dagger out of his belly. And the dirt came out, stuff from his intestines. Mm. And he would went forth through the porch, shut the doors of the parlor upon him and locked them. And when he was gone out, his servants came and saw that, behold, the doors of the parlor were locked. And they said, Surely he covereth his feet in his summer chamber. Now this covereth his feet is a, a way for saying he's using the restroom. Mm. <laughs> That's something that <laughs> I guess the, uh, in the, when King James was written, that was the <laughs> way of also maybe of <laughs> not saying what was going on. <laughs> And they tarried till they were ashamed, and behold, he opened not the door of the parlor. Therefore they took a key and opened them, and behold, their Lord was fallen down dead to the earth. So here you can see that uh, this was how this uh, evil man was put down by someone following God. And it says in, third, in verse 30, So Moab was sub subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest four score years. So for 80 years they had peace because they had defeated Moab. Uh, the next one we're going to look at is in uh, chapter 6. one to three first the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord when he was dead and the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin king of Canaan that had reigned in Hazor the captain of whose host was Sisera which dwelt in Horesha Horseph of the Gentiles and the children of Israel cried to the Lord <laughs> For he had 900 chariots of iron, and 20 years he mighty oppressed the children of Israel. So for 20 years he had oppressed them. So this is, they already had the 80 years of peace from Moab, and now this other man has been subjugating them for 20 years. So this is uh, 100 years later. So you can see that and when the children of Israel cry out, God delivers them. And so we're going to look at uh, verses 10 to 24. And he says, And Barak called of Zebulun and of Tali Kadesh, and he went up with 10,000 men at his feet, and Deborah went up with him. Now, for some reason, Barak was afraid to go alone, so he took this prophet named Deborah to go with him. And this had an outcome in, the, in this uh, particular episode. Now, Heber the Kenite, which was of the children of Horbah, the father-in-law of Moses, had severed himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent upon the plain of Zazizim, which is Kadesh. And they showed Sazira that Barak, the son of Jeboniam, had gone to Mount Tabor. And Sisera gathered together all his chariots, even 900 chariots of iron, and all the people that were with him from Horus of the Gentiles under the river of Kadesh. And Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thine hand. 
Is not the Lord gone out before thee? So Batak went down from the Mount Tabor with 10,000 men after him. And the Lord discomforted Sisera and all his chariots and all his host with the edge of the sword before Barak, so that Sisera lighted down from his chariot and fled away on foot. So somehow these few men could take over this entire army that was brought against them, uh, which is kind of amazing since they had chariots and horses and all these things, which is, you would think it doesn't tell exactly how it happened, but they were able to uh, take it over. And of course, it's, it says because the Lord discomforted Caesarea and his chariots and all his host. And that's happened many times in Israel's history where, where God came in and uh, People fled, not knowing what was going on and things like that. And uh, so it's it's uh, something that that God had done. But Amen. Barak pursued after the chariots and after the host to Horash of the Gentiles, and the host of Sisera fell on the edge of the sword, and there was not a man left. So all the the, the entire army was defeated; not one man was left. Albeit Sesra, the leader of them, fled away on his feet to the tent of Jabal, the wife of Heber, the Kenite. And there was peace between Jabin and the king of Hazar and the house of Heber, the Kenite. And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said unto him, Turn in, my lord, turn in to me. Fear not. And when he had turned in unto her, unto the tent, he, she covered him with a mantle or a blanket. And he said unto her, Give me, I pray thee, a little drink, water to drink, for I am thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk and gave him to drink and covered him. And again he said to her, Stand in the door of the tent. And it shall be when any man shall, doth come and inquire of thee, and say, There is no man here, what shall, thou shalt say no. And Jael, Niebuhr's wife, took a nail of, of a tent, or a tent peg, and took a hammer in her hand, and went softly unto him, and smote him with the nail into his temples, and fastened it to the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary, so he died. So there's another, what you would call a murder. <laughs> However, this is things that God did to, to uh, help him. And they say that the reason that it was a, a woman that, that killed the Sisera, it was because Vatek wanted Deborah to come out with him. He was afraid to, to do it alone. And so the, the victory went to a woman also as well as the, the uh, prophetess who helped him. And we're going to move on to a couple other things now. Uh, God approves of, of people being armed. This is... We see in many places, and back in Genesis 14, we're going to go back here, and we're going to look at Abraham had an army. Would you believe? A lot of people don't know that, but Abraham, way back in Genesis, had an army. And in Genesis 14, we're going to read 8 through 16. And there went out the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adam, and the king of Zaboni, and the king of Bela, the same as Zor. And they joined battle with them in the vale of Siddim. And Shedolamar, the king of Elam, and Tidal, king of the nations of and Amtaphel, the king of Shinar, and Ariak, the king of and those are four kings with five, and the vale of Siddim was full of slime pits. And the king of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there, and they remained fled to the mountains. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way. And they took Lot, Abraham's brother, brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. And there came one that escaped and told Abraham the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plains of Mamre, the Amorite, brother Eshkel, and the brother Abner, and these were confederates with Abram. And when Abraham, Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, it's actually his brother's son, but anyway, he armed his 
trained servants, born in his own household, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. So here he had his own trained little army there of his household. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants by night, and smote them and pursued them into Hobah, which is on the left of the Damascus. And he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. So here is this army way back in the book of Genesis, way before you would, you would think that there would be armies. Now Israel had army, and we're going to look at Numbers uh, chapter 1 here. And who was in the, Israel's army? Uh, let's take a look and see. Starting in verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tabernacle of the congregation on the first day of the second month of the second year after they came out of the land of Egypt, saying, Take ye the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel after their families by the house of their fathers with the number of their names, then every male by their poles. From twenty years old and upward, all that are able to go forth to war in Israel, thou and Arab shall number them by their armies. So here they're supposed to get all these uh, people from 20 years and upward who are able to go to war, and they'll be part of the army. So uh, they didn't really have a hard time finding an army, I guess, because if you were 20 years old and you were able to go to war, you were part of the army. And of course, you know that, that uh, there was many wars that, that uh, Israel fought during its times. And one of the things we find out about Israel's armies and things like that, uh, we're going to look here in uh, Nehemiah. Here it is. First Samuel 13, verse 19. And they were disarmed at this point by an enemy. Now there was no smith found through all the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, Lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his spear. Cher and Coulter and his action as Madoc, and they had a file for the Madocs and for the Coulters and for the forks and for the axes to sharpen the goads. So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul, Saul and Jonathan. But Saul and Jonathan, his son, was there found. And the garrison of the Philippines went into the passage of Mishpah. Now here you can see that that they were disarmed and controlled completely by the Philistines. They couldn't even sharpen their own farm tools. They had to go to them and, and ask them to, if they could borrow their file to sharpen their farming tools. Ooh. And that's what happens when you come under subjection of another nation. And uh, that's what happens when you're disarmed. Ooh. However, America does not have that legacy. America has a legacy of, of being armed. And I'm going to read a few uh, things here about the, the revolution. And then the right for Americans to bear arms. And it says, uh, the church became the primary source of stirring the fires of liberty, telling colonists that the English government was usurping their God-given rights which is true, rights are given from God. Amen. King and Parliament were violating the laws of God. Founding fathers were convinced it was their sacred duty to uphold the law of God against the unjust and oppressive law of men and to fight for political liberty 
was seen as a sacred cause because civil liberty was an inalienable right according to God's natural law. They believed the rebellion to tyrants was obedience to God. From many pulpits, ministers recruited troops and strengthened them in battle with patriotic sermons. And we can see that in the, in the Bible, in many places, uh, you're not supposed to, you're supposed to stand up to tyranny. Uh, one of them is uh, Acts 5.29, we ought to obey God rather than men. And that's something we should always remember. We should, God is supposed to be our ruler, and uh, we're supposed to be following him. The watchword of the American Revolution was, no king but King Jesus. <laughs> Their faith gave them the courage to stand on the word and risk their lives and properties to, to stop the tyranny of the unjust human authority. The Christian worldview, obedience to God, took precedence over the country or government, and their primary allegiance was to the Lord and Jesus Christ, and ours should be today. Amen. And of course, God... If you read stories of the revolution, you'll see where they're always talking about the providence of God causing there to be a massive flood to stop the British troops or, a, or a fogs would allow Americans to, to escape or uh, swamps to melt and their horses and, and cans get bogged down mm -hmm. and things like that. It was a continual thing, it seemed like, for the uh, providence. Yeah. God's providence throughout the, the uh, Revolutionary War. But our founding fathers were not, uh, they knew exactly what was, was uh, helping people. And we were supposed to be fighting off tyranny. And these are some of the quotes that they said. Uh, here's the, before a standing army can rule, the people must be disarmed. As they are in almost every kingdom of Europe, the supreme power in America cannot enforce unjust laws by the sword because the whole body of the people are armed and constitute a force superior to any hands of regular troops. And that was Noel Webster examining the leading principles of the federal constitution. So it, it, this I, I talked about uh, the principles of the constitution, how you're supposed to go back to what what they said in the Constitution and what they meant at the time it was written. Mm -hmm. But today they throw all that out and they go to, especially the Supreme Court, they go to foreign laws and, and whatever they feel is right for them and uh, follow their own moral codes, which most of them don't seem to have much of one. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, uh, we lost a Grace, great Supreme Court Justice yesterday, one who actually read the Constitution and the founding documents and, and knew what the Constitution said and always stood for it, even when he didn't always agree with it. And I guess in a few of his uh, things he says, well, I don't particularly agree with this, but, but it's the way the Constitution is written and what the founding fathers wanted and therefore <laughs> I'm going to stand with them because that is what the Supreme Court is supposed to do doing is interpreting and following the Constitution. They aren't supposed to just go off the track and do whatever they want to do. Because the right of the people to keep and bear arms has been recognized by the general government, but the best security that the right after all is the military spirit, the taste for marital exercise, which has always distinguished the free citizens of these states. Such men form the best barrier to the liberties of America. So here you can see that uh, they knew what it was all about in the beginning. Uh, here's Thomas Jefferson one in a, in a letter he wrote to, on every question of the construction of the Constitution, let us carry ourselves back to the time when the Constitution was adopted. Well, that's what the Supreme Court's supposed to be doing. Recollect the spirit manifest in the debates instead of trying what meaning may be squeezed out of the text or invented against it. Hmm. That's, that's our court today. Yeah. Conform the, to the probable one which it was passed. And here's one about the Bill of Rights. The whole Bill of Rights is declaration of the rights of the people. 
at large or considered as individuals. It establishes some rights of individuals as inalienable, in which consequently no majority has the right to deprive itself of. So even if these, they say even if the people voted to disarm themselves, it's not supposed to be that way. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have people today who would do that. So you can see that uh, that's one of the things. Now, another thing that that uh, Here's one from the Federalist Papers. And Americans have the right and advantage of being armed, unlike the citizens of other countries, whose governments are afraid to trust the people with arms. James Madison. So you can see that. Uh, now, we also mentioned uh, about guns being taken in other countries. And if you read what happens in other countries, uh, Vladimir Lenin said one of the basic conditions for a victory of socialism is disarming the workers and disarming the middle class. Joseph Stalin said if opposition citizens disarms well and good, if it refuses to disarm, we shall disarm them ourselves. Mm -hmm. Governments need armies to protect them against their enslaved and oppressed subjects. That was Leo Tolstoy. Here's the Professor Dean Morris, government employee, director of law enforcement, assistance, and administration. I am one who believes that the first step the U.S. should move expeditiously to disarm the civilian population, other than the police and security officers, of all handguns, pistols, revolvers. No one should have any right to anonymous ownership or use of guns. There can be no right of privacy in regard to to armament, we seek a disarmed populace. And of course, uh, Winston Churchill says, still if you will not fight for the right when it's easy to win without bloodshed, if you will not fight when victory will be sure and not so costly, you may come to the moment when you will have to fight against all odds against you and only a precarious chance for survival. There may be a worse case, you may have to fight when there is no chance of victory because it is better to perish than to live as slaves. So here you can see there's many people who have, have spoken up about uh, what we should be doing. Adolf Hitler said, uh, re required gun permits for all but Nazi officials. The German people are disarmed and were unable to oppose the Nazis. Mm. And let's look at a little history of, of gun control, where it is. Of course, uh, in Italy, or Soviet Union, of course, they established in the 1929. Uh, by 53, 20 million dissidents were able, unable to die, defend themselves, were rounded up and exterminated. 1911, Turkey established gun control. 1915 to 1917, 1.5 million Armenians were killed. Germany, of course, did it in 1938. Uh, by 40, 1945, 13 million Jews and others were exterminated. China established gun control in 30 in, no, in 35. By 1952, 20 million political dissidents were rounded up and eliminated. You can see it goes on and on. Uh, Defenseless people are rounded up and exterminated in the 20th, 20th century, or at least 56 billion. And now we have things in this country going on. Uh, just this last week, uh, there was a man who had turned out to be a Muslim, even though Muslims are peaceful, loving people who had never heard a fly. <laughs> they kill people, of course, that's all right. But we had a bloodbath at a restaurant down in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, with a machete. Yeah. Now, how many other people run around attacking people with machetes? You know, it's, uh, in Detroit, there was a plot to attack a megachurch, mm. and they just had a discussion on the radio into, uh, recently, and the man talking on the radio said uh, they would, he would never consider if they had security in his church to knock on the door, or ring a doorbell. He just wouldn't go to church. And I said, well, you know, here's their talking about shooting up churches, and if they have security and you have to ring a doorbell and identify yourself before you can come in, he wouldn't go. 
Okay. To me, that is foolishness. Yeah. And here's one of the last things I'm going to go for here. It says, uh, this is Ronald Reagan quote that he gave. We can't expect it both ways. We can't expect God to protect us in a crisis and just leave him over there on the shelf in our day-to-day -day living. I wonder if sometimes he isn't waiting for us to wake up. Yeah. Maybe he isn't. Maybe he's running out of patience. Mm. And that's really it. Now, if you remember, we had those two Muslims again in San Bernardino killing people. And I think it was the same Time magazine who had Ronald Reagan on the cover of, who had that quote in it, uh, saying, uh, where's God at this time? Why isn't he protecting us? Why aren't our prayers being answered? Well, we've kicked God out of everything. We've kicked him out of schools. We've kicked him out of public meetings. We've kicked him out of almost everything you can possibly have. And we've got to bring our country back to, to God. We can't just let it go crazy like this. Amen. That's right. And uh, I'd like to close there and uh, say, just remember that uh, God is our leader and we should be following him and not just listening to all the dictates of mankind. And of course, our Constitution was written by godly men and basically followed godly principles. And we should be following it. We shouldn't be allowing um, nine people to overturn everything that's America stands for. Amen. Amen. I'd like to thank you all for coming today. And uh, of course, if you're listening to us on the radio, you're listening to us on uh, Eagle Radio in Tampa and Ocala, 104.3. And, and uh, this is Pastor Fred from Doers of the Word Baptist Church, 14781 Sperry Road, Newberry, Ohio. 44065. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Are you fighting the fight? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we missed that on that one.